Hi, everybody, and welcome to A Talking Spartans, Graham Couch from the Lansing State Journal, along with Chris Solari. Uh, we are recording this late at night, uh, after midnight even, after Michigan State's stunning 27-24 um, win over Michigan today in Ann Arbor. We're both back in our respective homes in mid-Michigan, uh, doing this over Zoom, because that's how we do it in the, in the, in the COVID era. Uh, Chris, I mean, nobody, I don't think anybody, saw this coming from different people I talked to in the press box. People were saying like, this is the most wrong they've ever been. I certainly felt that way. Week one can lie to you in sports sometimes because you don't know how good opponents are. We had an inkling when we watched Minnesota on Friday night that maybe they weren't very good, but I don't think anybody saw a game where even though this was technically an upset by Vegas, this did not look like an upset. Like Michigan State outplayed them a lot of the game. Uh, to be fair, that 2015 Ohio State game, I believe, right before kickoff, you said it was going to be 57 to two. I did, I did. I predicted oh. Elite Calhoun safety. Uh, it's the two once that was right when I learned yeah. Connor Cook was going to be out. I got that wrong. And, uh, but, but to be fair, I mean, there are very few games in the history of Michigan State football where you think this. I, some uh, one of our my coworkers, Marlo Walter, asked that question to me. Where does this rank? Um, you know, in terms of Michigan games, probably with that 2015 game for a different reason because of the way yeah. it ended. Um, maybe the 95 game a little bit, but there was still a lot of NFL talent on on both teams. The Michigan State had the veteran guys, two first year coaches. And that Ohio State, the two Ohio State games that come to mind are the 98 and and that 2015 game. Yeah. Um, because even the Big Ten championship game in 2013. Um, you thought Michigan State could be competitive. Um, didn't know if you they would win, but this was a whole different dynamic whatsoever. I mean, this was a 21 point by the time it went off, 21 and a half, somewhere in that range spread. Um, and what's interesting is, is sort of, the, yeah, the lasting ramifications and how you put that in the historical context. Because like 95 at that point, beating Michigan nobody ever th thought Michigan State was going to pull even with them it was the idea you beat them that was a big deal but no Michigan State had not been on even footing for a long time this game is interesting because it had been eight of the last 12 eight of 13 when D'Antonio was the the coach and you had a feeling that Michigan was taking back the rivalry or that was their feeling and, and they looked like the season program and Michigan State had regressed to this middling program that they were and that that's where this was headed. And all of a sudden, in one game now, you've got the, you know, Michigan fans and the Michigan community really questioning Harbaugh. It's 9 of 13. Mel Tucker's 1-0. and And he gets that for a full year. And the, the whole dynamic shifted in the trajectory of the way we look at everything. So, I mean, I think that gives it, it makes it bigger than that. 2015, I think you're, you're right, because that saved a Big Ten title, playoff berth. I mean, so you can argue... But this is this is up there as one of the bigger wins, I think, and in, in really in MSU football history. Yeah, I mean, the 90 game that, that people love to talk about, I mean, that was – I mean, Michigan State shared the Big Ten title that year. I mean, yeah. so the, the 95 game, Michigan State was still a middling program. Yeah. Uh, that was Nick Saban's first year. And, and really, they were middling and then going downward after Saban left. So, I I, I mean, this is this is up there in terms of, of surprises – um, you know, historically, I got, I'm going to have to think back. To, uh, I know that there was the one game that, that Duffy Doherty kind of surprised them with, uh, the, was it the veer or the triple option? I can't remember which one it was, but, but I have to look back at that one. But in tar, as far as this one in particular, this is, this certainly ranks in the modern era. When you start talking about, you know, of the last 50 years, 60 years, somewhere in there, probably, probably the biggest surprise that, that is there is. Yeah, because it's, it's a combination of two, right? It's, it's surprised because of what happened against Rutgers and how Michigan looked last week. And then consequential because of where this rivalry is right now. I mean, right now, Michigan State can look, you know, Michigan State fans can walk in whatever meeting they're in this week. Michigan State people can feel this way. It is 9 of 13. They have won 9 of 13. And Tucker is 1-0 and for 12 months. And Harbaugh is 3-3 three and three against them. There is nowhere anybody, there's nothing, If you know, Michigan does not own the state right now. And this was a moment where it was supposed to be teetering that way. I, I, you know, what's interesting too is what Michigan State had to do to win this game was find things they weren't last week, right? And th th there's a lot of that. They didn't turn the ball over a single time after turning it over seven times, obviously. 
but the defense looked so much more physical, organized with it. I mean, uh, you talk about the improvement week to week. You find, you, you know, the receivers that you kind of know are playmakers really looked the part. We, we, we had no idea Rocky Lombardi could spin a deep ball like that with these guys. We had no idea really who Ricky White was in terms of college football. And he had eight catches, 196 yards. So, I mean, there's just so many things. They emerged a week after this awful performance against Rutgers and looked like a very different club and played, I don't want to say a perfect game, but it was pretty close, I think, for them. Yeah, I'd say near perfect because, I mean, listen, no turnovers, no yeah. sacks. Um, the penalties they had were mostly aggression penalties. You didn't see a lot of the false starts. You didn't see the holds. You didn't see a lot of, of the kind of things that tripped them up a week ago against Rutgers. Um, they played fundamentally sound. They played the assignment sound. I thought that was, uh, you know, from a defensive standpoint, a, a big thing. There was a lot of bending, and but not breaking. Um, the fact was, that – you know, that's a great point. It's you know, When people say bend but don't break defense, usually if you're a fan of a team, you groan, right? It's like, oh, I hate that idea. Yeah. But this is how it's done perfectly. To make, like Michigan, that final drive Michigan had, they took so much time off the clock. It was such a grind for them yeah. that it didn't leave them a lot of options after they scored that touchdown. Well, there was no urgency for Michigan either. And that's that's the, the real interesting part of that last, you know, after Connor Hayward scores that touchdown uh, with, uh, with who – we need to talk about him at some point, but a tremendous game and some big, big plays, uh, maybe none bigger than that one. But um, Michigan came out with no urgency, um, really needing to march most of the field and used almost all of the remaining 5-11. I, I mean, and it by the time they got to the end zone, I think there was 37 seconds left. Now you're on a wing and a prayer. I mean, they were playing like they were down one score. And I didn't understand that, but you know, you got to credit Michigan state's defense because they didn't give up big plays. And, and I don't know if Michigan thought they would be able to hit a big play on them, but the fact that they only gave up two plays over 20 yards, both in the passing game and neither of them longer than 26 yards. Yeah. Um, that was a big, big, that was almost as much of a difference as Rocky Lombardi hitting five passes of 30 or longer. Yeah, and and you know I, I can't remember the last time that I've seen uh, a, you know it, it's got to be probably 2014, and not even in a game this consequential to see them go that deep that often. They had, they clearly found something on film they thought they could take advantage of. Credit the coaches too for saying this is what we do well, we can do well, and these might be Michigan's vulnerabilities. And, and not only that, I mean they, they, they just looked like the offensive line looked better. The run game looked competent you know 126 yards there you know they were they were functional and they got pushes when they needed it and yeah um i mean huge I, factor i mean I, you have to be able to at least feign the run you can't be putting up you know 1.3 yards per carry like they did against Rutgers. i mean i think it was around three a little over three and a half under three and a half um but that's what you need you i mean a lot of that came on jordan simmons big run that that set up that first touchdown but you have to have a semblance of a run game. You have to show it. And, and 126 yards might not look like a lot of yards, but when you're throwing the ball as much as, as they are right now, and, and they should because their playmakers are at receiver, they've got all that speed that, that you see now that I think the, the one thing about Ricky White that we had heard was he was a burner. He was a guy that could get separation and go deep. I don't know if anyone would have projected this kind of game. And if if he hadn't beat out Trey Mosley and Mosley uh, – you know, obviously the reason Ricky White played so much is because Mosley got hurt. If he hadn't beat him out in camp, well, how good is Trey Mosley when he comes back? Well, that, 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 that that's, you know, that's four receivers right there. And one of the things I think MSU fans can, can really take some comfort in is, and I think one of the lasting things out of this game, I, I still think like you look at the schedule, 500 should maybe be the goal uh, realistically because, it, you know, it gets, look, Iowa looks will be competitive, it looks beatable, but it's a it's a good competitive team. Indiana's tough; they just beat Rutgers, and so on and so forth. They, they, there aren't a lot of easy weeks in the schedule, but they're going to have this win over Michigan. And even if they are mediocre as they build this, this is a young group of receivers, and they are going to be entertaining and exciting and capable on a given day of beating you. Because when you you're right, you add Trey, Trey Mosley to the to the mix. Um, that's they become very, very dangerous, as dangerous a group, uh, maybe as they've had, you know, I, I I mean, you go four deep, you're starting to talk about things that I don't even remember. I want, you brought up a guy I wanted to get into and Connor Hayward, because 
I mean, here's a guy who left the program, comes back, takes a lot of flat because he is not a dynamic running back. He is a, but he's a versatile player. Uh, and, and you saw that versatility today. And a heck of an athlete. And I think that, yeah. you know, and that's one of the things that, that last year kind of got lost in translation. I thought that Connor Hayward showed his athletic ability, but has been kind of, you know, there's been, it's been kind of a square peg round hole situation where you want to make him a between the tackles runner, but he's at his best when, when you do what they did today and put him out on the screen pass, um, you know, get him to the edge a little bit, let him, and, and that opens up some things for him when you do run him in the middle. Um, I thought those two catches that he had for touchdowns, a real nice route out of the backfield where they flooded the right side and then he breaks out to the left and, and, you know, had short field to get to the pylon and did. And then that 13 yard touchdown at the end that, that really ended up being the, the winning score um, a, a tremendous move at the goal line. I mean, he had some good downfield blocking from Nick Samak and, I don't know if Jalen Naylor really threw a block, but he was running interference enough that he didn't get called for a blind side, which as we've seen is all the rage right now, but, but Hayward spins into the end zone and then comes back and gets that onside kick. You, the, the, the hands that he has um, that I think he's shown the last two years makes him a very versatile threat. And Mel Tucker, and I, here's something I think that you'll probably want to chime in on a little bit. Mel Tucker talked again and I think he's been pretty vocal now for two weeks about the guys that are playing um, have earned their keep in practice. And we, you saw Hayward and you saw uh, Jordan Simmons, essentially the only two running backs. I think there was one series with Elijah Collins. And for them to go into Michigan and do this, no one would have thought that Elijah Collins wouldn't have played a factor if it did happen, right? Correct. Yeah. And he brought it up with Ricky White saying this is a guy who's done it in practice and we wanted to transition into the game. Yeah, no, I, I think that it's clear that Collins is a third guy now. And that's and when Collins gets in there, he doesn't look dynamic. I don't think anybody's questioning that for a while. It was I think it's taken people to put their get their heads around it because, you know, he was so good last year. And he, right now he's not that same back doesn't mean he won't become that back again. Um, but but Jordan Simmons clearly looks like the best option uh, running the football and, and to that Hayward touchdown. You know, it was an amazing catch by Ricky White where it bounces off the defender and he comes down with it. And that gets him at like the three yard line. But then they get the penalty. And it looks like they might get stuck with a field goal out of that where you're only up uh, one or six points with Michigan able to still get, you know. Yeah. And it's that touchdown, you know, gives them the, the, the breathing room. And uh, it was just a, it was a, it was a critical, uh, critical play in, in, in a lot of ways. And the other play that we haven't really talked about, and it's, it's kind of hard to fit it in with so many of the things that happen is, is that fourth and one call at the end of the game after Hayward makes the, 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 the recovery on the onside kick um, one give the, the offensive staff and Mel Tucker credit for letting Lombardi make the decision on what to do. They called the timeout. They, they tried to draw him offside. Didn't went back out, tried it again and had time on the play clock and said, if you see a spot to sneak, go for it. Not only did he do it on fourth and one, he got three yards to run it out. Um, gutsy call on decision on his part, but an even better play and, and toughness to, to get the tough yardage. And there is clearly a kinship between Tucker and Rocky Lombardi. He likes him. Uh, Lombardi embodies what he wants. Um, and Lombardi is, I, I mean, I, I look, you start beating Michigan, people stop saying, oh, who's the next guy? Um, I, I think Lombardi has shown himself to be the guy for this team. I think when you listen to the way Antoine Simmons talks about Lombardi as sort of his counterpart on the offensive side and how they lead together, I, I think there are just, um, though th it's clear that he, you know, there, there's something about him that this team respects when you show up and play like you did today. I mean, when you go 17 for 32 and 13 of your passes are over the top, that, I mean, that's not, I mean, and you know, like seven of them were for 40 yards. I forget the exact numbers. Anyway, these are not high percentage throws, right? Usually. And so right. you're still 17 for 32 over 300 yards. Uh, you know, I, I thought he played, I mean, he was better than Joe Milton today. And, and, and that's, you know, that's one of the things again, game week one can lie to you a little bit. And I think Joe Milton's a heck of an athlete. I think he's a good quarterback at the college level. He may become somebody who plays at the next level if his game continues to, but if you make him uncomfortable, he's not going to pick you apart going down the field yet and, and with his arm. And, and that's something I think the, the, the coaches saw on film and they knew they just had to make sure that that didn't 
transpire and they made him uncomfortable all day. Yeah, and give um, that even though the stat, I mean, I should say that the stats don't really reflect that. It's one sack, two hurries. But he didn't he didn't have the he didn't have a clean pocket. A yes, lot of that he did a, a moving out of the pocket. I thought Jacob Slade and Deshaun Mallory and Naquan Jones had a great day in the middle. Uh, they forced yeah. a lot of that. Uh, Noah Harvey was was aggressive and attacking, um, shot some gaps, hit him hard early. Um, as I, as here we are at well, it's technically only eleven twenty five because since we get the clock moved back, the extra hour. Yeah, I'm watching the, the game back, and I mean, the, you know, he he got a clean shot on him, and Milton made a heck of a throw. Yeah. To, to get a completion, but I thought Michigan State's defense did a good job adjusting to what Michigan was doing early and running so many slants at them. Um, they were running them in front of the in front of the safeties and in particular Trey Person, and I think they made some adjustments there uh, to cut some of the depth that that they were getting, and and those plays started to dry up as the game went along. Yeah, no, I I, I would I, like I thought. The reason I thought Michigan State couldn't win this game was not that they couldn't score points. I didn't expect to see the deep balls that we saw. I didn't. I didn't expect Ricky White had one catch for five yards last week, but I thought they maybe will get in the end zone and create a couple of big plays offensively. They turned the ball over a lot last week, but they showed a little bit of um, punch there. The defense I thought was going to get blown through, and I thought the offensive line was going to get blown through. And neither of those things happened. In the trenches, they were at least as good as Michigan. And that was stunning to me. And it was right out of the gate. You saw that first um, defensive stand, you know, and you go, wait, well, wait a second. That three and out looked pretty good. The, the defense, it started with the defensive line. And then all three levels, I thought, played a pretty good game. And, um, it, you know, I mean, that's... They played smooth and they look like they're really starting to adjust to that four, two, five, a yeah. little bit more. And, you know, maybe you, I mean, you, you obviously needed some sort of game simulation to kind of understand it maybe. And uh, the, the changes that, that that side of the ball and really the offensive line made between week one and week two were impressive and, and significant. This was a game. I mean, it's weird. Cause this is a season in a lot of ways. I think we'll look back on, you know, in a year or two and say as an overall year in college football, this year really doesn't mean anything. But this game is going to mean something for a yeah. long time. And the ramifications of it, and, and Mel Tucker just helps recruiting. It says this, our program is here, is what he can say to recruits, you know, and is in that, um, I, you know, and, and you know, he, I, mean, I just think, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't like to overstate how much a win does for recruiting because that's not really always how kids choose. But you do hear examples where I was watching this game and I love the way they played. And I do think it allows him to say to kids, there isn't a gap. We're going the right way. You know, choose choose this. Uh, and it, it speaks to the buy-in and the program. It, 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 he'll, fans will listen to him when he says he knows what he's doing now for a while. Uh, I, I just I, – I can't speak to the, how big this was. Yeah, as, as, as big a loss as the Rutgers was because of the name, yeah. um, and Rutgers could still be decent this year, and it still won't matter because it's still Rutgers – the same goes the other way for how big this win is. It's still Michigan. It doesn't matter where Michigan ends up. And if they end up good, bad, mediocre, um, it's still winning at Michigan in your first game against Michigan. I mean, that holds a massive amount of weight. Well, the season just got interesting. And uh, Chris and I will be on the road covering it all uh, next week in Iowa. And uh, lots of stuff before then. It, it's going to be, it's going to be kind of, it's going to be kind of fun. I think, uh, be sure to read his stuff at freep.com and, and green and white and LSJ with my stuff as well. Um, we will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching.